So good morning all and welcome to Camp Nelson National Monument. My name is Steve Fan. I'm the Chief of Interpretation and on behalf of the National Park Service we are grateful to have you with us here today. Before we start the program and introduce our special guests, our entire staff would like to acknowledge Luke Perkins of the Maintenance and Facilities team for his tireless efforts in clearing the snow and, the make, and making the park accessible yesterday. He, <laughs> he also prepared the barracks room for this presentation. Luke is new to the National Park Service and recently started at the park. He's quickly become an invaluable member of the team. So again, uh, Luke, you wanna uh, raise your hand, please? Let's take a moment to acknowledge Luke. So thank you, we really appreciate that. So I call this a new beginning, my friends. This is a first. Our staff have uttered those words often during the past year as we continue to build this new National Park Service unit. This is the inaugural Camp Nelson National Monument Winter Lecture Series. Our aim is to invite speakers from a diverse uh, array of fields to present on topics uh, on a wide uh, range of subjects related to the Civil War era, especially Kentucky and the African-American experience. This, year, uh, this year's series features four presentations from January through April 2022. Our schedule reads as follows, um, following Jared's presentation today on February 5th, uh, the program is entitled Archaeology of Camp Nelson, Civil War Supply Depot and Emancipation Center for Kentucky by Dr. Stephen McBride. March 26th will be Embattled Freedom, Journeys Through the Civil War's Slave Refugee Camps by Dr. Amy Taylor. Yay. Wow, all right. <laughs> and then April 16th is called Kentucky's Road to Loyalty, Secession, Neutrality, and the War in 1861 by, Patrick, um, by Dr. Patrick Lewis. Yay, okay. <laughs> okay. So it's quite the lineup uh, to, to inaugurate uh, the annual series. This will be an annual series, so you'll see this moving forward at the park. So let's talk about our friend here. I, ha I have this entitled Frederick the Great. Our guest speaker um, is a dear friend and colleague, and one who first approached me about this fascinating topic, African-American soldiers in Civil War cinema. So who is Jared Frederick? Well, he has a lifelong passion for American history, Prior to his current position as an instructor of history at Penn State Altoona, Frederick served as a park ranger at Gettysburg National Military Park and Harpers Ferry National Historical Park. He is currently earning his PhD in history at Penn State Altoona. He is the author of several books, including Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion, Hang Tough, The World War II Letters and Artifacts of Major Dick Winters, and the forthcoming biography entitled Fierce Valor, The True Stories of Ronald Spears and His Band of Brothers. Frederick has appeared on C-SPAN, PBS, numerous National Park Service productions, and various online documentaries. In 2019, he, act, uh, he acted as a guest host on the Turner Classic Movies for the channel's 25th anniversary. He is also the host on the popular YouTube ch uh, channel, Real History, which you can see on the screen there which separates fact from fiction in, in historical movies while also underscoring how such films offer reflections of society. Today, he will be pursuing similar themes as he explores how African-American soldiers have been depicted in Civil War cinema. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Jared Frederick. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm really honored to be here for the inaugural lecture of the inaugural series here at Camp Nelson. Uh, on my journey down here from Pennsylvania, I was uh, really looking forward to the prospects of some uh, mild southern weather. Uh, perhaps uh, in the 40s or the 50s, a little bit of refri uh, reprieve from the tundra up in Pennsylvania. And uh, as it turns out, it's worse down here than up in Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, it's been a, a very interesting journey uh, these, these past few days as I've been enjoying my time here in Kentucky. But let's talk about a, a far more interesting journey. Uh, that is a cinematic journey. And it is the story, above all else, of memory. Uh, memory is one of the most integral components of how we 
assess, understand, and reflect upon the past. And uh, on my channel, Real History, uh, I often make the argument that there is no more powerful a force in recognizing the past than Hollywood. Uh, people will watch the worst of movies in far greater number than what they will read the best of history books. It's just the, the truth of the matter. Uh, we watch about 10 movies for every one book that we read in this country, and that statistic isn't getting any better. Uh, and so whether we're talking about the 1920s or the 2020s, Hollywood is a force to be reckoned with in how we look at the past. This is especially so for the American Civil War, and in line with the history of this camp and uh, the conflict as a whole, what we're going to be taking a look at today is how African-American combatants have been portrayed in Civil War cinema over the course of the last century. And uh, we're going to be taking a look at the highs and the lows, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, just a little bit of a disclaimer here before we start off. Um, we're going to be watching some film clips uh, integrated into the conversation today. Uh, some of those film clips contain insensitive language and also scenes of violence. I don't want anybody to be taken aback uh, by that uh, too, too much. But if we take it in its historical and cinematic context, I think we'll be able to soldier on through. Long before movies came about, there were alternative means of commemoration often through public art. And uh, the images that we see here on the screen offer us a good indication of the earliest phases as to how United States colored troops were memorialized in the years following the American Civil War. Uh, there were the popular lithographs in which people could hang in their parlors that honored them. Uh, and there was also statuary. Uh, and uh, perhaps two of the, the best known statues of the era we can see here uh, on this slide. Um, in the background, we can see the Shaw Memorial uh, dedicated to the commander and the men of the 54th Massachusetts. And uh, here in the foreground, we can see the Emancipation Monument that was dedicated in Washington, D.C. Uh, fairly immediately uh, after uh, the American Civil War. And there are Two common threads that we see in this statue, in these statues, that are also often replete in cinematic depictions. And that is that a white protagonist is at the forefront. Uh, in the 54th Massachusetts Monument, we see Shaw on his horse. He is the centerpiece. His men are in the background. And likewise, with the Emancipation Statue, uh, we see that marble image of Lincoln, the great emancipator, uh, giving away freedom, shall we say. Um, and of course, with this uh, monument in the foreground in particular, uh, it, it ne neglects the fact that freedom-seeking slaves sought agency themselves. They often determined their own freedom. They gained their own freedom. And certainly we can see stories tying in with that at places like Camp Nelson. Uh, but it shouldn't be any surprise to us that these sorts of images and themes are also going to be found in movies in the years to come. Uh, but sometimes it takes on a darker element as well. And unfortunately, one of the largest cinematic blockbusters, one of the first ones ever, is also one of the most controversial in American history. And that was D.W. Griffith's 1915 film, The Birth of a Nation. And uh, cinematically speaking, uh, this movie is considered a masterpiece. It was really one of the first movies to introduce scope, scale, uh, zooming in and out on characters' faces to introduce pathos. Uh, you know, cinematically, artistically, it is considered a real game changer. Culturally and historically speaking, though, as many of you very well may be aware, it is much to be desired. Uh, and in short, what the birth of a nation did is that it depicted United States colored troops not as liberators and not as heroes of the American Civil War, but it depicted them as sexualized childlike predators 
who would prey on innocent, vulnerable white women in southern states, both during and after the American Civil War. And to add insult to injury, uh, some of the main African-American characters in the film are actually white actors wearing shoe polish in a form of blackface. This is the case with uh, the, the main black character in the film whose name is Gus, who is also the key villain in the film as well. And in these earliest moments of cinematic history, African-American troops are not depicted in a positive light at all. But in tandem with some of the remnants of the lost cause and Confederate mythology, uh, the Ku Klux Klan is depicted as the good guys in this film. That, that's the simple way to put it. And a rather gullible public embraced this idea. They thought, oh man, this is exactly how it happened. And this was further substantiated by none other than the President of the United States at this time, Woodrow Wilson, the first Southern president since Andrew Johnson, met Robert E. Lee when he was five years old while he was growing up in post-war Virginia. And a special screening of The Birth of a Nation is hosted at the White House. And at this moment, Wilson purportedly says of the film, it's like writing history with lightning. My only regret is that it is all so terribly true. <laughs> and so when you have the President of the United States saying things as such about this immensely popular movie, a lot of American audience goers are going to very much buy into that idea. And rather than watching a clip of The Birth of a Nation all by itself, uh, we're going to tune into a, a scene with a little bit of commentary uh, by one of my favorite historian TV personalities, Dr. Henry Louis Gates. Most early films consisted of one reel, lasted around 15 minutes, and cost a few hundred dollars to produce. All of that changed in 1915 when a film called The Birth of a Nation, a three hour long saga, was released by director D.W. Griffith. It instantly stood out as a technological and storytelling marvel. It also stood out as a monumental piece of blatantly racist propaganda. The Birth of a Nation fixes a certain story of the Civil War and Reconstruction in the minds of the American public. And that story is that black people were too lazy and ignorant to fully master the citizenship that they were offered by Reconstruction. Birth of a Nation really didn't have black people in it. So these white people in blackface portraying congressmen who are obviously not ready for self-government, portraying the idea of the rapist and these are all the stereotypes that are believed by many, many Americans. The film was met with fierce resistance from African Americans, particularly from a recently founded organization focused on the advancement of the race, the NAACP. One of the most important early initiatives of the NAACP was organizing against the birth of a nation. They generated a lot of interest by protesting the film and drew in a great deal of support from African Americans. Despite its best efforts, the NAACP couldn't persuade censorship boards or theaters to limit the film's reach. But the young organization gained national prominence because of this campaign. That year, membership almost doubled, and that number would continue to grow as it mounted the fight against Jim Crow. Those activists dissented at the time, and those dissenting voices were always there. They were there during the darkest periods of American history. And remembering that tradition, to me, is almost more important than remembering the failures and the losses uh, and the terrorism that black people faced. What we see here as a result is a tug of war, not only on current events, but also, yes, uh, but also current events as well. Uh, 
On the more positive side, we see the growth and the activism of the NAACP and uh, some of the other work that the NAACP was doing in the late 1900s and early 1910s was battling against Confederate monuments. Uh, and so there's no coincidence that we see this resurgence in Confederate monuments beginning in the 1910s and going into the 1920s with the growth and the popularity of the birth of a nation and also the concurrent rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so, uh, you know, as we consider some of the long-term consequences of this, I don't think it's a far stretch at all to make the conclusion that the popularity of the birth of a nation delays the civil rights movement as we know it by 50 years. By the mid-1920s, the Ku Klux Klan has six million members throughout the United States. It was more powerful in the 1920s than it ever was during Reconstruction as a political force to be reckoned with. And while we're thinking about how movies and cinema and public theaters tie in with all of this, of course, in many regions throughout the country, both the South and the North, if an African-American citizen wanted to see a Civil War movie, they would often have to do so in a segregated movie theater. And this is a prime example of uh, one such facility that we see here. As we get into the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, things begin to change somewhat, albeit a, a bit slowly. In 1939, we have the biggest blockbuster of all that is released, and that is Gone with the Wind. 120 million Americans went to see Gone with the Wind in 1939 and 1940. Uh, that was essentially every grown adult in the United States at that time. Uh, there hasn't been anything like it since. I, mean, I suppose it's somewhat comparable to Titanic or Avatar or Lord of the Rings, uh, if you will. Uh, but there are some really interesting and sometimes conflicting dynamics that we often see in Gone with the Wind. And while there are no United States colored troops portrayed in it, it presents this kind of indelible interpretation of African Americans during and after the Civil War. And that representation is best conveyed by actress Hattie McDaniel, who plays Mammy in the film. And, you know, in some ways you could make the argument that Mammy is sort of this stereotypical maid figure who is portrayed in the film. But yet at the same time, I think you could also make the argument that she is the smartest character in the movie. <laughs> she knows what's going on. She knows what's going on behind the scenes. And although the movie does not obviously uh, convey that sort of sentiment, when you really critically watch Gone with the Wind, uh, Mammy's definitely the smartest person. She is, you know, the one who's all-knowing um, in many, many ways. Uh, but, you know, when Hattie McDaniel wins the Academy Award and she becomes the first African-American actress to receive an Academy Award, uh, some within the ranks of the NAACP were very critical of her characterization. Um, and to that, she fired back and she said, I would rather play a maid than actually be one. Um, and, you know, so that, that was her rationale. And uh, she became a, a big game changer in the Hollywood system as a result. Things begin, uh, begin to alter further once we get into the years of the Second World War. And uh, one individual we have to thank for starting to change a lot of minds is director Frank Capra, uh, who is better known for directing Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and perhaps some of you watched It's a Wonderful Life a few weeks ago um, around Christmas time. But during World War II, Frank Capra uh, directed a number of documentaries for the War Department called Why We Fight. And one of the films within that series was called The Negro Soldier. And it went beyond the typical stereotypes and characterizations that were seen in a lot of big Hollywood blockbusters up until that time. And it presented a far more empathetic view, saying that if we expect men of color to wear the uniform of the United States military and to fight for this country, we need to begin to offer them a degree of equality and respect. And this film was by and large produced 
to essentially break the ice for white service members who may have been prejudiced and to more openly accept men of color into the ranks. Um, and so these are some of the big themes that we see in that transition era from the 1930s to the 1940s going into the 1950s and more broadly the civil rights era. And when we get into the 1960s, uh, this is where we begin to see United States colored troops uh, begin to make a stronger appearance, more pronounced appearances in movies set during the Civil War era. Uh, and one that is of particular interest, that is a, a lesser known Western directed by Sam Peckinpah uh, that starred Charlton Heston called Major Dundee. And Major Dundee takes place in Texas and Mexico in the year 1863. And Major Dundee is in charge, in part, of a Confederate prisoner of war camp. Uh, but when the Apache go on the war path, he finds himself a short man, and he has to pull troops from all of these unlikely areas. And in his command, he uh, pulls in uh, Mexicans, Confederate prisoners of war, and also United States colored troops. And throughout the film, and it's a really fascinating dynamic, the characters are often at odds with one another. And in many ways, it's a perfect allegory for the 1960s. You know, it's only a few years after the military is integrated, and it sometimes led to tension in real life, and you see that tension likewise being conveyed in Major Dundee. Um, and the interesting thing here is that uh, several of the actors in this film were very much involved in the civil rights movement. Uh, Charlton Heston was present for Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech um, on the Lincoln Memorial. And up top, we see him with Burt Lancaster, uh, Sidney Poitier, unfortunately, who just passed away this week, and Harry Belafonte. Um, and uh, the, the main um, African-American character in this film, we can see him down here at the bottom of the poster, is uh, portrayed by Brock Peters, um, who was a very prominent character actor of this time. And uh, his best known role was for playing uh, Tom Robinson in To Kill a Mockingbird that was made just uh, two years earlier. Um, and so there are a lot of overlapping themes of the civil rights era that can be found in this film. And it conveys one of the, the big ideas that we find in historical films. Historical films not only tell us about the time that they depict, they also tell us about the times in which they were made. And that is something I want you to keep in mind as we continue to move forward here. Um, so, next up, we're going to take a look at one of these tense scenes in Major Dundee. November 19th, we are in Mexico. And this day's events have made it clear to everyone that the Major's present war is not with the South, but with the Apache. Lunge! That's very good, Aesop. Thank you, sir. But as Napoleon said, only thunderbolts can be preferred to cannon. Good night. Good night, sir. Order arms. Thank you, Prim. Boy. Boy. Boy, I'm speaking to you. You're forgetting your manners, nigga. Come on over here and pull off my boots. Lieutenant Graham, check the pickets. Did you hear me, boy? Good boy, now. 
Let me, son. Let go of my leg! Sure, kick up a lot of dust with your sermon. Don't forget your foot gear, Sonny. Oh. You started it, now finish it. Oh, we're gonna finish it. My dog is preacher now, we're gonna get in line for you. How about cutting you a piece of you first? You southern trash, sit down. Was you talking to me, Sergeant? Now, maybe you don't know it, but you're fixing to get tried. You and all the rest of your blue bellies. like to compliment you and your men on the way you handled the river crossing this afternoon. Thank you, sir. It's a fascinating scene that plays out, and it's as reflective of the 1960s as much as it is the 1860s, because it begs the question, who is going to stand up to injustice? Who is going to intervene to stop violence? And certainly these were conversations and tensions that were playing out in the year 1964, as well as 1863. The following year, there's a better known Civil War movie uh, that is released to audiences, and uh, that stars actor Jimmy Stewart, and it is called Shenandoah. Uh, and this one, too, is a product of its times in a number of different ways. Uh, the premise of the film is that Jimmy Stewart plays a Virginia farmer who is struggling to keep his sons and his family. Uh, out of military service and out of being uh, affected by the war. Uh, and uh, in many ways, it's an anti-war film. And a lot of the conversations had in this film forecast conversations that would be had in the United States as the Vietnam War was escalating in the 1960s. But it also offers commentary on the civil rights movement. And we likewise get another depiction of United States colored troops in this film. Um, in the scene that we are going to watch next, um, one of Jimmy Stewart's sons uh, witnesses a battle. Uh, he, he, he wears a, a Confederate cap as a souvenir. He's not actually in the military. And this gets him into some trouble and he has a rather surprising encounter as a result. So let's go ahead and take a look. Well, now, look how young this one is. 
I swear to goodness that these here Rebs ain't gonna be sending out grandpappies and old ladies next. Let me hold that rifle, Johnny. My name isn't Johnny. Let me have the rifle. What for? Well, somehow it just don't set right with the officers when they see prisoners walking around armed. Now, give me that rifle before I put a ball through that dumb head of yours. I admire spunk in a boy. But if you don't do what I say from now on, you're gonna find out spunk don't come free for nothing. All right, Reb. Let's go. I'm no soldier. Now, I don't look that ignorant, do I? We seen enough of them Johnny Reb caps to last us a lifetime. Go tell my pa. Where are they taking you, boy? I don't know. Just go tell him what happened. You don't have to tell his pa nothing. You're free. The scene is a very short but revealing one, and I think it's revealing for two reasons. Uh, one, it acknowledges a emancipation as one of the legacies of the war, and it does so in a way that very few Civil War films up until this time did. And secondly, you'll notice that this small squad of federal soldiers, it's integrated. Uh, you know, black and white soldiers did not serve together in regiments as such during the Civil War. But obviously, the filmmakers are trying to convey a message here. And so once again, most definitely a sign of the times. That becomes even more pronounced uh, 12 years later, when we have one of the biggest television events um, in TV history that is aired. Uh, and that is the miniseries Roots, based on Alex Haley's best-selling novel. And uh, while this film, too, it does not per se uh, show the exploits of the USCT, um, it nonetheless brought forth a racial reckoning in a way that few films up until that time had. Uh, because really, for the first time ever, the horrors and legacies of slavery were brought into Americans' living rooms in a very profound way. And well, I think one of the really fascinating uh, thematic devices uh, in this film is that all of the slave owners, they are portrayed by lovable TV dads. You know, the, the, the dad off the Waltons, the Brady Bunch, Bonanza. Because the filmmakers wanted it to be jarring. You know, and they cast these otherwise lovable actors into these horrific roles. And that was done purposefully to put people at a certain level of unease. Uh, and so, you know, it's fascinating stuff. And there's so, so many uh, legacies uh, from Roots. And it, it remains one of those gold standards of uh, 1970s television and beyond. Um, but keep this film in mind because uh, we'll be revisiting one of its other legacies in a little bit. And in the next decade... It shows us how Hollywood goes full circle between the time period of the birth of a nation and 1989's glory, directed by Edward Zwick. Uh, when Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington were presented the scripts for this, they were immediately captivated by it, predominantly because both of them admitted that they had never known that black soldiers served in the Civil War. It was not taught in schools, and they had never heard about it growing up. And immediately, they recognized that it was a story that needed to be told. Now, there, there are some historical shortcomings, I think one could argue, um, in the movie Glory. It plays loose with the facts now and again, as do all historical films. Um, most of the men in the 54th Massachusetts had been free their entire lives. We get a somewhat contradictory view in this film where we get the, the perception that uh, these men mostly had been former slaves. Um, and the other shortcoming of the film is that none of the African-American characters in it are real-life people. 
Um, essentially, the only real life character is Robert Gold Shaw, played by Matthew Broderick. And so if we think back to that first slide that I showed you, and we think about the Shaw Monument, uh, once again, there is a white protagonist who is at the forefront of an African-American story. Now, suffice it to say, he was the commander of the regiment, and he played a very big role in its exploits um, and in its fate. But I suspect if the movie were made today, over 30 years onward, it would be made in, in a very different way. Um, but all that said, what the film does excel at, and this is really what, what the filmmaker was going for, is that it offered an excellent overview interpretation of the African-American experience during the Civil War. Maybe not always the 54th specifically, but African-American units, the USCT in general, it does an excellent job. And one of the most revealing scenes, two scenes actually, both of which we're going to watch here back to back, has to do with themes of equality and pride. So we'll take a look at these films, or these snippets, let them speak for themselves, then we'll dive into it a little bit further. Where you going, boy? To get paid. Ten dollar, a lot of money. Hey, Pop, you finna lay down for this, too? Hey, 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 come on, bro. Where, where's your pride, now? Make your mark right here. Look, look, hey, I can write my name. Go then do it. They're gonna give them $13, they're gonna give us for 10 You're gonna go for that? Huh? I mean, a color soldier, stop a bullet just as good as a And for less money, too. Yeah, yeah, old Uncle A ain't got himself a real bargain here. Hey, what you say, Buck? That's right, slaves. Uh -huh. Step right up, make your mark. Get your slave with you. Yeah, boy, all you, right. you good color boys, hey. go ahead and sign up. That's right, tear it up. 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 Tear it up.
um, is a, a film by uh, uh, director Ang Lee, uh, and it's called Ride with the Devil. And uh, this one looks at the border wars in Kansas and Missouri. Uh, and I think in many, many ways it does uh, an excellent job of characterizing this neighbor against neighbor fight that often took place in this borderland area. Uh, but within this film, it gets into a degree of controversy to an extent because one of the main characters in the film is a slave by the uh, name of Holt, uh, who is played by fantastic actor Jeffrey Wright. And uh, he is actually, you know, fighting with these Confederate irregular troops. And it gets us into the, the controversies and debates about black Confederates, the roles of African Americans within the Confederate labor force um, and whatnot. And of course, there were no substantial numbers of, of black Confederates um, in any Confederate army. Um, but nonetheless, in regard to this movie, there is one depicted as such. Um, and uh, he goes through a really interesting evolution, though. And he's a very different man at the end of the film versus what he was at the beginning of the film. Throughout the movie, Holt forms a friendship with actor Tobey Maguire's character. Tobey Maguire's character is of German descent. And for all intents and purposes, both of these men consider themselves to be outsiders. And as a result, they form a rather unlikely friendship. Um, and so in the scene that we're going to take a look at here, we're going to see how that friendship further develops and how they often spend time with one another while they're hiding away, trying to flee federal cavalry, uh, is that uh, the, the white soldier reads captured federal letters to Holt. And that's how they spend their time. And that's the scene that we're going to take a look at here. Father believes the war will go on and on, but is ever more committed to the struggle. He manages to send ever greater numbers of slaves up north to freedom and away from the grasping hands of their masters, who even in the midst of all attempt to lay claim to them. The Confederates claim that we strike at their liberty and rights, but what kind of liberty is it that takes away the liberty of others? Hey everyone, here I am not at Camp Nelson National Monument, and that was due to a uh, slight uh, technical glitch that we had during the filming, but I am here right now to fill in the gap in producer Andy's basement uh, to carry the narrative forward. The next film that we are going to be taking a look at is Steven Spielberg's 2012 film Lincoln, which starts off in a very prominent way, highlighting United States colored troops and their quest for equality. And the scene that we are going to take a look at right now introduces us not only to Abraham Lincoln, but some black soldiers who have higher expectations about their service. Let's go ahead and take a look. Some of us was in the second Kansas colored. We fought the Rebs at Jenkins Ferry last April just after they killed every Negro soldier they captured at Poison Springs. So at Jenkins Ferry, we decided we weren't taking no rare prisoners, and we didn't leave a one of them alive. The wardens of us that didn't die that day, we joined up with the 116th U.S. Colored, sir, from Camp Nelson, Kentucky. What's your name, soldier? Private Harold Green, sir. I'm Corporal Ira Clark, sir, 5th Massachusetts Cavalry. We're waiting over there. We're leaving our horses behind and shipping out with the 24th Infantry for the assault next week on Wilmington. How long have you been a soldier? Two years, sir. Second Kansas Cutter Infantry, they fought bravely at Jenkins Ferry. That's right, sir. They killed a thousand rebel soldiers, sir. They were very brave. And making three dollars less each month than white soldiers. That's second Kansas, boy. Another $3 Whenever subtracted now, from our pay for our uniforms. That was true, yes, sir. But Equal that's pay strange. now, but still no commissioned Negro officers. I'm aware of that, Corporal Clark. Yes, sir. That's good that you're aware, sir. It's only Do that... Do you think the Wilmington attack... Now that white people that's... have accustomed themselves to seeing Negro men with guns fighting on their behalf, and now that they can tolerate Negro soldiers getting equal pay, maybe in a few years they can abide the idea of Negro lieutenants and captains. In 50 years, maybe a Negro colonel. 
In a hundred years, the vote. What would you do after the war, Corporal Crow? Work, sir. Perhaps you'll hire me. Perhaps I will. But you should know, sir, that I get sick at the smell of boot black and I cannot cut hair. I've yet to find a man who could cut mine so it would make any difference. You got spring here for a white man. Yes, I do. <laughs> My last barber hanged himself. <laughs> and the one before that. <laughs> Left me his scissors in his will. <laughs> President Lincoln, sir. You boys. Yeah. We saw you, right? We, we were at... Uh, it was in Gettysburg. Uh, you boys fight at Gettysburg? No, we didn't fight there. We just signed up last month. We saw him two years ago at the cemetery dedication. Yeah, we heard you speak. We had... Ah, damn, damn, damn. Uh, hey, how tall are you anyway? Oh, gee, shut up. Could you hear what I said? No, sir, not much. It was... Uh, it four was... score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth from this continent a new nation conceived in liberty to be dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That's good. Thank you. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are... We are... We are met on a great battlefield of that war. That's good. Thank you. We Thank come you. to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It His is... uncles, they died on the... On the second day of fighting. I know the last part. It is, uh... Company up! It is rather... Move it out! Boys, best go and find your company. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. God bless you, too. God bless you. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. There are a lot of things to enjoy in this opening scene. Well, first and foremost, the shout out to Camp Nelson, right? And uh, uh, the, the 1 16th uh, portions of it were, in fact, uh, mustered into service here, although they did not fight in the Battle of Wilmington, North Carolina, as the film suggests. Uh, and, you know, some other things to enjoy as well. Who are the first people you see in this movie? You see United States colored troops. It makes the case clear right from the outset. And additionally, you know, a lot of film critics thought that the, the reciting of the Gettysburg Address in these opening scenes was rather cornball, perhaps a little bit over the top and hokey. Uh, but I, I showed uh, this movie to students in one of my classes, and they were able to pick up on something that none of the film critics were. And they determined that by opening the film with the Gettysburg Address, that it constructs this moral foundation for the rest of the movie, where Abraham Lincoln says this thing in the year 1863, and now he has to help make good on the promise of equality, of freedom in America. And who are helping to make that reality come to fruition? the black soldiers that we see in the opening scenes here fighting at Jenkins Ferry. So it's a really revealing scene. There's a lot that we can unpack and there's a lot that we can, uh, you know, interpret um, in these, these opening clips. Um, and I think, uh, despite what some critics say, um, it's a fantastic opening to a fantastic film. Kind of another hidden gem, if you will, is the movie The Birth of a Nation. Uh, a very purposeful titling of this film made exactly 100 years after the D.W. Griffith movie of the same name. And this film, uh, by far, far contrast, is about the 1831 Nat Turner uh, slave rebellion that took place in Virginia. And the majority of the movie is set in 1831 Virginia, and we see how this slave uprising and this quest for freedom unfolded. Uh, but at the very end of the movie, and I'm not going to show it to you because I don't want to ruin it for you, um, is what I think is the most powerful scene in the film. 
where a young slave boy who saw and experienced trauma as a youth, he is transformed by to the end of the film into a soldier in the United States Army. And uh, it, if you ever have the chance to see this film, I would uh, most definitely encourage it because the ending surely packs a punch. And uh, speaking of uh, other uh, productions uh, that are remakes or of a similar title, in the year 2016, the miniseries Roots is remade. Uh, and this time it airs on the History Channel. It was a four-part series, and there are some considerable digressions from the original 1977 production. Uh, the most notable digression uh, is the inclusion of Kunta Kinte's descendants serving in the American Civil War. Um, and this is the character Chicken George. Some of you may remember him from uh, the original series in the 1970s. Uh, and so it shows the military experience. The original series only alluded to it. Um, and something else that it does, uh, the inclusion of which I think is very important and very telling, is that it offers a depiction of the Fort Pillow Massacre which took place in 1864, in which several hundred mostly black and white soldiers uh, were annihilated, mowed down by the Confederate troops of Nathan Bedford Forrest after they had, by and large, surrendered their arms. Now, it, it's not a very authentic depiction uh, in the film. It didn't really happen in, in the way that it shows. Uh, but I think the fact that it is depicted is the most important aspect of it of all because you know this is something that has long been overlooked there are still people to this very day who deny the atrocity and the the level of butchery that was inflicted there and you know for all intents and purposes i imagine many a television viewer this was their first time being exposed to that previously hidden history and so once more uh, despite perhaps um, some of the historical errors that we see in the film uh, a series or a movie such as Roots, it can be the beginning of a conversation. And I think for we as historians, uh, movies serve as a very important function in that regard. Uh, a movie that comes out that same year, the very same month as a matter of fact, uh, is what I think is probably the best cinematic depiction of reconstruction. Uh, and it also uh, shows a lot of uh, irregular warfare, if you will. Um, in Civil War Mississippi, and that is Free State of Jones. And this is based on a true story of the Knight Company, headed by Newton Knight, played by Matthew McConaughey in this film, uh, who gathers a band of Confederate deserters and uh, self-emancipated slaves uh, who decide that they are no longer going to be subjugated by the forces of the Confederacy. And so you see this uh, integrated southern force uh, who are fighting Confederates, who are poaching off the land, uh, taking crops, seizing livestock, and denying people their ability to survive. Um, and once again, you know, it, it's not a historically perfect film, uh, but it, it here too, it is a far cry from the likes of the 1915 version of The Birth of a Nation. And then uh, finally, the last movie that we're going to talk about today is a movie that came out in 2019, and that is a biographical motion picture about the, the life and times of Harriet Tubman. And uh, the majority of the film uh, looks at her exploits in the 1850s in which she shuffled slaves back and forth across the Mason-Dixon line. Um, but the very end of the film, uh, takes us to her efforts with the United States Keller troops in 1863, South Carolina. And uh, here too, we'll let the film clip speak for itself and what we see and kind of the, some of the themes that are presented. Suppose there's a snake coiled at your feet and shoots up to bite you. Folks get scared and send for a doctor to cut out the bite. The snake, he roll up dead. While the doctor cutting, bites you again. In a new place this time. Finally, you realize the snake ain't gonna stop till someone kills him. 
slavery is still alive. Those rice fields downriver are feeding rebel troops with the toil of a thousand slaves still in bondage. Our mission is to free those slaves. We've waited years to be allowed to fight in this war against our own enslavement, and it will not be won without us. Now is our time. You ready to kill the snake? Yes! Wade in the water. Wade in the water, children. Wade in the water. God is gonna trouble these waters. Leave you with a little bit of a cliffhanger on that one. <laughs> uh, here too, it's, it's very revealing. This is a movie from 2019. And, you know, in, in the wake of this movie, in the midst of this movie being made, you know, our country is going through the, the likes of a renewed civil rights movement that we have not seen in many years. This movie, too. It is a product of its time showing an empowered woman of color leading 150 United States colored troops in the quest of liberation. Um, and so here, too, uh, it is a, a sign of the times. It tells us as much about our present era. Uh, as much as that of the 1860s. And as we ponder all these things, as we think about memory, uh, we could also and should think about the power of place. And you can all wonder, you know, what brought you here today? What brought you to this park for the very first time? And I have no doubt that perhaps for many of you and for visitors to come, it very well may have been a movie that sparked your interest. Perhaps you saw the movie Glory. Perhaps you saw the movie Lincoln. You realized that an element of the Civil War played out in your own backyard. While historians uh, often tend to uh, have, uh, shall we say, um, moments of frustrations and be disgruntled about the inaccuracies of historical films, I think, more importantly, historians need to use history movies as a platform for discussion. We can talk about what movies get right, we can talk about what they get wrong, but if they bring visitors in through that front door, we can argue that that's a good start. Uh, and so, uh, that is, in a nutshell, uh, the evolution as to how African American combatants have been conveyed throughout Civil War cinema. I hope that this has been a worthwhile conversation for you. I hope you gained something valuable. And I thank you for coming out here in this winter wonderland to support your local national park. Thanks for coming out today. I thought a lot of you would, might be interested to know that on our online store, which you can find the link to right at the bottom of this video beneath the caption, that you can discover some of our custom-made historical t-shirts, some of which tie into the very episodes of the Pacific that we are taking a look at. 
a vast portion of the proceeds associated with uh, the production of these t-shirts goes to support our channel. If you are a fan of real history, if you would like to see us grow, these funds help us attain the, the new equipment, materials, uh, travel expenses necessary to allow this channel to grow. And so any form of support that you can offer is much appreciated and is a beautiful bonus. You get one of these really nice custom made t-shirts to go along with it. So we hope that you'll support us. We hope that you'll enjoy some of this history swag that you can wear while you're out and about and help spread the word.